This is my friend Angelica. Have you guys seen her around the church? Do you Sometimes. guys have you? Do you know who Angelica is? Well, her and Dennis do the midweek conversation. Uh, stay tuned for a commercial for that. Uh, keep your eyes open on on the app. Uh, anyway, I moved up here from the Verona area because I saw what River Hills can do at a community. And then after I've been spending more and more time here, it has been amazing to watch what River Hills or um, Christ's Bride can do within us mm -hmm. as individuals. And they change hearts. And I say that because I love watching you. I love watching you work. I love watching, I love hearing um, how God has worked in you. I love hearing about your past. I love seeing how things are working now. Um, I know most of our pasts can be a little tumultuous, mine too, so don't ask stories, but uh, <laughs> like we are the lucky few that get to like just be a part of something super special. And I just want to say thank you, and I'm excited to listen to your message. Thank you. Anyway, I'm going to pray. Uh, God, I am praying Jesus' name over um, Angelica this morning. Uh, <sighs> The way you move, the way you work, the way that you put your arm around us, the way that you comfort us, the way that you just tell us, I got this, is amazing, God. And so this morning, I'm going to ask that whatever Angelica is feeling, like she can just step aside and your, your words, your message, everything comes through her. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Wait, can you, where's, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, I don't know how to do it. Thank you. Perfecto. Yeah, I'm so glad he introduced me, because if I would have just came up here, you'd be like, why does Dennis look so different today? <laughs> Is it my hair? Like, what gave it away? <laughs> like, <laughs> but no, yeah, my name is Angelica. I went to the University of Northwestern St. Paul, Minnesota, not like the cool one, I'm sorry. Uh, it is the cool one, it was just the Bible college one. And I got, I got double majored art and design in theological studies, so I do like to read the Bible. I'm not just like up here for fun. <laughs> I, like, I, I kind of am, but <laughs> yeah. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, let's do a little review on what we've been talking about. We're in a summer of revelation or that's what I call it. I think that's so fun. A summer of revelation. Nobody else says that, but I mean, if you want to start saying it. Um, <laughs> we've covered some ground since week one. We did some word studies. In the first one, we talked about apocalypsis being the unveiling. So that word revelation means apocalypsis, and then that means the unveiling, not in the same way that we know apocalypse like in our culture today, like giant waves and like zombies and stuff. It's not that. And then we also talked about the word soon, meaning more like when I say, I'll see you in a minute, I don't mean I'll see you in 60 seconds, right? So that's, that's how we should think about that word. Um, yeah, overall, I think we've come to an understanding so far going through this series that this book is less about a doomsday play-by-play -play and more about being a book about promises, anticipation, understanding, and even joy. And I know there can be a lot of apprehension towards this book, but learning what we have now, we can begin to see that it's actually not just this huge obstacle that no one can get through. However, we still need to go forwards on this path thoughtfully, and if we jump to conclusions about things instantly, we'll sadly miss the beauty and the lessons and the details that can only be found on the journey of learning something. So with that in mind, let's hop into where we're starting today, Revelations chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, and I'll have my mom read the scripture, be my liturgist. She's just a little bit better at it than I am, so <laughs> I'll have her do it. <laughs> oh, yeah, the microphone. Sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. La, 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 la. I also sing here, so if you guys want to hear something, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. 
You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen from your first love. Turn back to me again and work as you did at first. If you don't, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. But there is this about you that is good. You hate the deeds of the immortal Nicolaitans, just as I do. Anyone who is willing to hear should listen to the Spirit and understand what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Everyone who is victorious will eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Thank you. See, wasn't that great? I couldn't have done that. Thank you. Um, so let's look at the setting of this, the setting of chapter 2. Right now, uh, we're in Asia Minor in the first century in a Roman province called Ephesus. There's an arrow pointing to it right there. And the name Ephesus may sound familiar to some of you for a few reasons. Firstly, because we literally just read about it in Revelation chapter 2. Secondly, because of the two recorded stays in Ephesus that occur in Acts chapter 19, 20, and 19, 18, 19, and 20 by the Apostle Paul. And because of the book of Ephesians, which is also six chapters written by that same Apostle Paul. And because of the first, second, and third John, which are written by the Apostle John while in Ephesus. So that's before his exile to Patmos and his visions and recordings that we see in Revelation. So looking at all of these accounts here, one begins to think that maybe there's something we're supposed to get from Ephesus, right? We just keep hearing it. It just keeps repeating. There's a pattern that seems to be happening. So what was the Ephesian church like before we see them again at the end of the Bible? And why is their letter one that gets both praise and scolding and then praise again? Like a, like a little happy sandwich. You're pretty good. Not so good okay, you're pretty good, you know? Why do they get both sides of this coin? I think it's necessary to look back at the roots of the Ephesian church in order to understand the impact of that sentence that Jesus says later, turn back to me and do the works you did at first. What were these works they did at first? Understanding this can help us feel the full impact of the Revelation letter because we can understand truly what the church at Ephesus had lost in their decades-long journey. While the chapter 2 letter in Revelation is addressing a well-established Ephesian church in the 90s of the first century, the roots of this church began about 30-something years prior and around the 60s of the first century. And yes, there are different date approximations by different scholars to these exact times, but I'm using 90s and 60s to simplify everything. Um, so the surrounding environment of the Ephesian church was formidable. Ephesus is right on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, and they were definitely the forerunners in trade, religious cults, and commercial networking. So let's go back to the 60s and see what's going on. Paul's first visit to Ephesus is recorded briefly in Acts chapter 18, where he doesn't stay long, but promises to be back if the Lord wills it. And so the Lord wills it, and he comes back, and that's where we pick up in Acts chapter 19. And this is around the time of what's considered the official establishing of that church at Ephesus. So Acts chapter 19 in verse 1 begins, while Apollos was in Corinth, and Apollos is another missionary who you can read about in Acts chapter 18, 24 through 28, if you really are interested. Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast, where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them, no. They replied, we haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience, he asked. The baptism of John? This is talking about John the Baptist. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. And you can cross-reference this with John 1.27, Mark 1.17, where in both passages John is referring to the Messiah, or the one who comes after, or the one who comes later, whose sandals I'm not worthy to unloose, right? That's Jesus. So as soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then, when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. And there are about 12 men in all. Look how quick and eager they are. 
None of them are dragging their feet. They're just racing towards this deeper understanding and relationship with Jesus. None of them are uptight that they are getting correction from Paul. They accept that he has knowledge that they just didn't know about. They don't let their arrogance get in the way of advancing their relationship with God. Also in Acts chapter 19, there's an account of a riot that occurs in Ephesus because of the fact that so many people were turning to Christ that the silversmiths who made these idols to Artemis, they began to lose money. <laughs> they were not happy about that, right? So we can see in 20, verse 26, this is one of the angry guys. He's like, but as you have seen and heard, this man Paul has persuaded many people that handmade gods aren't really real at all. Oh my gosh, guys, like what? Crazy. And he's done this not only here, but in Ephesus and throughout the entire province. He's angry. So everybody's getting geared up, and there's yelling, and there's screaming, and there's kicking, and there's punching, and they all rush into this amphitheater, and then we get to verse 32, and verse 32 says, inside, the people were all shouting, some one thing, some another. Everything was in confusion. In fact, most of them didn't even know why they were there. Okay. So this is the kind of environment that the Ephesian church is growing up in, dealing with people who are just willing to charge after you, and fight you, and try to take you down, sometimes without even knowing why. Why are you doing it? They don't know. They're just angry. Okay, good reason. Like, it's not. This is an extremely difficult environment to live in, and Paul knows this. So he makes sure to invest in their growth. In fact, the general consensus among scholars is that Paul hung out in Ephesus for around two to three years, which is a pretty significant amount of time in his missionary journey. There he also pens Ephesians, well, when he's traveled on to Rome and he's imprisoned. And then the letter of Ephesians ultimately is a letter of encouragement and direction to the believers. The letter aims to guide those who read it and hear it to function as a living body of Christ on earth. So look how, look how Paul is gushing over this church at Ephesus in Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 13 through 18. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news, that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. And we just read about that moment in Acts. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give you the inheritance he promised, and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. Ever since I heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus, your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. So if Paul is saying this to the church at Ephesus, the church at Ephesus is doing extremely well at this time. If someone says that about you, they love you. You're doing very well, right? You can't just like praise someone on nothing, right? So what are we seeing about the church in Ephesus so far? Well, they have received the Holy Spirit. They have strong faith in the Lord Jesus. And they have love for God and God's people everywhere. They are, at this point in their journey, doing very well. The praise and joy that Paul is sharing with them seems very warranted at this time. In Ephesians, we're seeing the church at Ephesus grow up from baby Christians to mature Christ followers. And the rest of the letter is also full of good stuff. The themes include learning about God's eternal loving plan, which sustains our salvation, identifying and resisting false teachers of the gospel, understanding Christ as the center of our lives and sustainer of all creation, working as a living church body and family of believers with unique gifts and abilities, learning about the newness of life that Christ followers get because of God, through Jesus, who paid our penalty for sin, forgave us, and draws us near to him, and how to con conduct ourselves in wise and responsible ways by living out Christ's new standards for us. But principally, Ephesians reminds us over and over to love each other and to be kind to one another. That really means to follow Jesus' example in everything we do, which is always, without fail, an example of love. And if the church at Ephesus is taking all this to heart, they are doing a fantastic job. And if 
They are living out all of these things and more. Those are certainly people to learn from. In fact, the Ephesian church at the beginning of its upbringing seems to be full of excitement and commitment and love for God. This is a place where you can see that people are committed to doing the Lord's work and the hard work for the kingdom of God, regardless of their surrounding environment. The church here doesn't crack under the pressure of what surrounds them. And we even see that clearly through the letter in Revelation. Verses 2, 3, and 6 speak very specifically to their victories. I'll go back to it so you can see. Let's see, right there. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they're apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. Chapter, or verse 3. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting in verse 6. But this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans, just as I do. And if you're wondering about verse 6, the recorded history of these Nicolaitans is brief and speculative, yet the general understanding is that they are a group of Christians who had compromised their faith and practiced their own version of faith, which was probably some blend of idol worship, pagan practices, and overall unacceptable behavior. So basically, verse 6 is saying, you hate the evil practices that this popular group of people is involved in. It didn't matter if they were trending or whatever. God's people at Ephesus didn't follow along. <laughs> Thank you, Scotty. <laughs> at this point, we can see Ephesus has a ton of brownie points. And they are, in fact, so good now that they are beginning to have some snobbiness in their actions. Their emphasis on sound teaching was choking out authentic love. I mean, don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong. I know they clearly had a lot of reasons to be prideful. They had conquered this and conquered that, and Paul stayed with them for years and wrote chapters worth of letters, and John stayed with them and wrote chapters worth of letters. And they were, in essence, becoming this prime example of the Christian faith walk among those around them. But even in all this, arrogance was not the answer. It is not the answer, and it is not the way Christ teaches us to be. Everyone knows how good it feels to be right about something. Everyone knows that. And it feels especially nice to be sure about something that other people are having a hard time being sure of. The Ephesians had gotten to this point. By Revelation chapter 2, they were like, well, we had to overcome that. We had to fight that. We figured out that obstacle. We don't know why you're acting like it's so hard to get up here. And they're acting like this despite the fact that a few chapters ago, in Acts chapter 19, they didn't even know who the Holy Spirit was. One of the prime bedrock foundations of the Christian life is the Holy Spirit. They didn't know who that was. Okay? So God's like, uh-uh. I don't know who you think you are. He's like a parent going, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. <laughs> Not like I've ever heard that, but I'm just saying. <laughs> he says in verse 4, I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Okay, this is not a good thing to hear at all. This is like having your engine light, brake light, airbag light, and battery light all going off at the same time. And why? Because what does Jesus respond when asked, which is the greatest commandment? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Everything hangs on these two commandments, Jesus is saying. And these are the very same two commandments that the Ephesians are completely neglecting at this time. So in essence, if these two things equal health, and they don't have these two things, they're not healthy. Their car is broken, or whatever analogy you want to use. Verse 5 in Revelations digs in to them. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. Look how far you've fallen. Yeah, look. We have spent a lot of time just looking at how far the church at Ephesus climbed, what they'd endured, and how at one point they really were in love and on fire for God. And their love towards each other was also kind and understanding. Then, almost silently, it seems like something else began to creep in and change the authenticity of their behavior. 
This reminds me of the Old Testament book of Daniel in chapter 4, when King Nebuchadnezzar is looking over Babylon so pridefully. And he's like, how amazing and powerful Babylon is. And it's like the ultimate achievement of perfection, all due to me. And God cuts him off mid-sentence in that, throws him out of power, and casts him into the fields like a wild animal, until he can acknowledge that God is sovereign and that he is the one who holds all the power. And just like God can cast Nebuchadnezzar down because of his arrogance and pride, he can do the same to Ephesus or anyone who would follow that path. Now, this is not to say that the church at Ephesus is like that Old Testament king, but the lesson is the same. God is sovereign. And sure, the church has had great successes along their path, but what is success if you've ultimately lost sight of what matters? What benefit is it to only appear as if you are the best? There is no benefit, and that's a hollow living to chase after. God is calling for all who have turned away from him to turn back around. Don't give up on the commitment and love you had at first. He's saying, don't make our relationship just a bunch of empty professions and actions that only come out of a desire to be the most right, or the most intelligent, or the most devoted. Don't do this when your actual love for me has diminished into less than a smoldering ember. Jesus gives them the letter in Revelation 2, not to reprimand them or to make them feel bad. That's why a good chunk of that letter is devoted to showing affection for them. He gives it to them because he loves them so much. He doesn't just say, I'm unhappy with you, and then not tell them why. He's not cruel like that. He says, you're doing pretty well, however, you are missing a critically important element to this equation. You already know what it is. You had it right before. So go back, plug that in, and you'll be golden. Can you think of places in your life where you are like the people at Ephesus? Don't worry. You're in good company, and Jesus hasn't given up on us. This is a letter that we can all learn from. We know the scriptures aren't written to us, but for us. And that is also a way to understand that final verse in the Revelation letter. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. And yes, we all have ears. And it's not saying that if for some reason you don't have that little piece of cartilage attached to the side of your head, then this text isn't relevant to you. It's not what it's saying. It's saying that everyone who has spiritual perception should listen. And to those who listen and respond accordingly to what the Holy Spirit is leading them to, they will overcome evil. This is because if you are following Christ, you are under his protection. Bless you. You are in his flock and a part of his team. And he's saying, my team has won. So if his team is the winning team and you're on his team, you've also won. <laughs> that doesn't mean it will be an easy journey. I hate to break it to you. I'm sorry it won't be. I mean, if you experienced like the flooding from last night, you understand that it's not going to be easy. Um, but it does mean that we get insanely awesome advantage in having the actual God of the universe guiding us through it all. Listen, the church at Ephesus had it rough, and they did struggle to get the success that they had. They were not perfect, however, and they'd still required correction. In the same way, we may struggle and work very hard in our faith journey, and we may achieve some pretty cool things, but ultimately, we have to keep the love for God and others firmly in our hearts. That means that our actions have to be honest with one another. That means just not falling back on our assumptions and feelings about God and others, but allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us and inspire us in whichever way he leads. Jesus has this one complaint against the church that has a in verse 4. You do not love me or each other as you did at first. But yet, he already gave us the key to how to reverse that behavior and turn back to him. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And with that, that's it. Go and be the church. <laughs> I'm done. I don't speak for 45 minutes like Dennis does. Um, <laughs> no offense if you're watching right now. <laughs> I will pray us out, though. <laughs> Dear God, thank you for bringing all these wonderful people in. I pray for their safe journeys home and for a yummy lunch that they all can have. Um, we thank you that we get to be here gathered um, to read your word and that we have freedom and joy in that. Um, 
we just pray that whatever needed to be received in the Holy Spirit has been received today. Um, we love you very much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.